when you are in junior science lesson, your teachers told you that the atom consists of three fundamental particles, electron, proton, and neutron. Let's take electron as an example. It has been discovered by physicist J.J. Thomson for more than 100 years ago. Do you think the scientists will be settled by this finding only? The answer is obviously no. We find something called quarks, which are the composition of proton and neutrons. So yes, we lied to you. But I guess you just have to understand this. Just like in maths, you are told that, hey, uh, if you have A multiplied B, it should equal to B multiplied A. But then if you learn about something called matrix in mathematics, you know that is not necessarily true. So when you are learning things that things might be simplified when you are learning it earlier and later on you are more learning the advanced and more specific idea about it. Okay, so here is a big picture of what physicists have found so far. And if you look at this picture, it may look very scary to you because you know probably nothing about it. Uh, let me point out the key idea first. First of all, this is called the standard model. And all these things here, all these square here, uh, are describing the elementary particles. And you can see they are color coded. So for the purple one, you can see all these here, they are called quarks. So something that I just mentioned earlier. And there are something called leptons, which one of them is the most familiar to you that is electron, or right, is one of the leptons. On the right hand side, we can see uh, there is something called the elementary boson. And you can see there are a few kinds which we call a uh, gauge boson and there's another one called hex boson. And in case you have heard about it, this is called the God particle. And yes, these may be too many names for you, but don't worry, right? Eventually you get to know all of them. Now, if you try to pay close attention, you should find these are called the matter and these are called the antimatter, which is split by this line. Okay, so the group on the left hand side are called the matter. The group on the middle column, should I say, uh, is called the antimatter. And you can find they are all symmetrical. So, for example, you have the up quark, which correspond to the anti up, the charm correspond to the anti charm. You also have the well known electron correspond to its antimatter called positron. For this one, it's a bit more special because positron is something that we find historically and uh, we didn't know it's exactly antimatter of electron and so we gave it a name and eventually yeah, we, we keep this as the name called positron. But you can see for the rest of them, uh, it's basically called anti of something. And the other thing that you have also heard earlier is called electron neutrino and here you can see it's also called electron antineutrino and so this is how this picture can be simplified into this if we just skip the antimatter of those quarks and lapton you also have a similar one in the data booklet which will be very very helpful when you are doing your IB physics exam however before we talk about how to make use of this data table Let's think about how we actually know all these things. How do we know about the existence of quarks? Think about this analogy. If there are really something that is more fundamental than proton and neutron, then the only way to find it out is to smash them, right? To break them open. So just like these building blocks, the only way to find out if there are anything inside or smaller is crush it right to smash it so that it will break over the place and see what we find and so the physicists just build it this is the gigantic experiment setup to find out if there are anything more fundamental than proton and neutron and this is located in geneva and as you can see 
the whole thing, the whole circle, is more like a running track, right? It's a building that is as 100 km long, not to mention those at the side. And this whole thing is called LHC, Large Hedron Collider. Let me give you some time to guess how it works. The answer is actually very simple. When you want to break something open by smashing them together, of course you have to accelerate them. You have to make them go very, very quickly. And there are two things that will smash together. And since you don't want to get any other noise from other sources, probably what you want to do is having, for example, proton smashing with proton, simply. And so what you could do is by applying what you have learned in maybe other chapters earlier, uh, that's when you apply electric field or magnetic field, uh, then you can actually accelerate and get the charged particle to go in circle. Right, so here is one loop and that is also why we also need another loop. And so um, when you want them to collide and when they have enough energy, then you can open the gate and let them smash together simply. And this is how it works in simple words. So here is a picture of how the hedron collider look like inside. And you can see by comparing the size of the person to the structure, you can see it's really gigantic. The other concept that I would like you to appreciate also is that uh, this is not just a simple experiment run by scientists. It takes a lot of effort and investment uh, concerted collaboration with different perfections. So including not only scientists, but also um, engineers who can build this, uh, architecture who can make sure the whole structure can be safe, and also uh, the sensors are very hard to build as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's really something that is as difficult as to land on the moon. I'll recommend you to go and check out this 360 video made by BBC uh, or maybe the second one here which explain to you the detail of how the large hedron collider work with the amazing animation or the 360 videos. Go and check it out, I'll put the link in the description below. Okay, so back to the data table, let me show you how we can make use of it. First of all, let's just look at the quarks first and um, maybe identify their name first. So U is up, D is down, C is charm, S is strange, T is top, and B is bottom. So again, these are just the names. Now let's do a very simple task. If I tell you these are the composition of proton and neutron, so for proton it will be up, up, down, for neutron will be up, down, down. Can you use this and also the table to calculate the charge number? Pause the video and try it out yourself. A few moments later. Okay, so let me show you how we can do it. First of all, you have to understand how we can read the table. And so we can see in this row, this is a charge for these three kind of quarks. And this is the charge negative one over three for these three kind of quarks. And so if you look at proton, for this charge number, so I will just write this uh, for, you know, quick note. And of course, when you're doing exam, of course, you should write the full name. So what we get is we got U, so U is positive two over three. Uh, when they don't write, it means positive. And then you have another U, so also two over three, and then you have one D, D is right here, which has negative one over three. So you can imagine it's plus negative one over three of the charge. So eventually you should have one positive charge. And that coincides with what we understood as proton. Proton, of course, will have one positive charge. Next, for neutron, the charge number 
would then be u, which we have mentioned earlier is positive 2 over 3 by looking at the left hand side column and then uh, you have two down quarks so each of them will contribute negative 1 over 3 and so let's just write it out and if you try to calculate again obviously it's going to be 0 and again coincide with what we understood as neutron being neutral so 0 charge so now you have basically master the idea of how to find and calculate the charge of the quarks when they are put together and now let's move on to another idea called the barrier number if I ask you to find the barrier number you may not know what it is but let's take it as a number first of proton and neutron again these are their composition and if you look at the table you will see that hey all these are actually the same is 1 over 3 for both of them and so obviously for each of these they would have 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 for both of them and that is positive 1 eventually for its barrier number for both proton and neutron and then you may say hey that isn't some, something meaningful if it, they are always 1 over 3 then the answer will always be 1 in fact, if you recall earlier, I showed you the very extensive uh, picture of the standard model. You should recall there is something called anti quarks. So, for example, here we've got the up quark, and there is something called the anti up. For notation, whenever you draw a symbol for the anti matter of something, you can always put a bar onto it. Okay, so this is a standard notation that you can use in physics and as you could see for this up quark it will have a charge of 2 over 3 e positive and 1 over 3 barrel number and so antimatter is kind of having a property that is opposite of what you have here so for its charge it will become negative 2 over 3 e for the barrel number it's going to have negative 1 over 3 and so because of this, then uh, we will have three different kind of branches for hedron. Okay, and remember you have heard about the name Large Hedron Collider, right? All these three kinds are hedron. And below you can see there's something called baryon. And in fact, I think this picture can be improved if, you spe if we specify this as the baryon and then this as the anti baryon and he here is the meson so uh, if you could you can try to draw a tree diagram to show that all these three is a subset of hedrons and so now you may ask why are there three kinds of hedrons why not four why not two only why must it be three kinds of hedrons the answer is think about the barrier number so first of all, like the proton and neutron that we mentioned, they are under the category of baryon, the regular baryon. And the composition of them is of three regular quarks. And if you look at their baryon number, each of them will provide you positive 1 over 3 according to the table. And so when you add them up together, it's always positive 1 for the baryon number. In another case, when you think of putting a quark and anti-quark together, remember just now I mentioned for anti-u, the barrier number is going to be negative 1 over 3. And it's actually the same for any other regular quarks here. The anti-quarks is going to have negative 1 over 3 barrier number. So for all this kind of structure, we will have a quark that provides you 1 over 3 positive for barrier number and negative 1 over 3 from the anti quark. So when you put them together, the total barrier number that you will have at the end is going to be exactly 0. So this is another kind of category. So we call them Mason. Mason is just a name only. Don't worry about the name. And lastly, of course, we could also put down three 
antiquarks together and each of them will provide you negative 1 over 3 negative 1 over 3 negative 1 over 3 for its barrier number and in total you will have negative 1 for the barrier number of this hedron and that is why we call this category as anti barrier because they have a barrier number of negative 1 and if you think about it these are all you can have already because you cannot have a barrier number of 2 because basically they will become two hedron two separate hedron uh, which doesn't make sense uh, so you can only have integer which is positive 1 0 and negative 1 in case you're asking me why we cannot have say two regular quarks and having a barrier number of positive 2 for free the answer is simply this is by observation and in fact the whole system uh, is built by scientists uh, to help us to figure out some you know computation or some uh, reaction so that uh, it's easy for us to work with um, we never observe there's any hedron that are made of two quarks simply so that's why we chose to have barrier number to be like this in the system so that it's always either one zero and negative one eventually and now you may be ask me why do we have to learn all these things or why this has to be so complicated with all these strange number and we always have to look at the table if I have to answer you in one word I would say symmetry think about this for the many years that you have been learning in science whenever it's possible we try to look into things that are being symmetrical and if things are being symmetrical in time that means they are not going to be changed over time if you think about it so that is to say for example in this picture this is showing you simply a chemical reaction and the idea that it obeys is conservation of mass because the mass should always be the same of on left hand side and right hand side here is a picture of the pendulum and so this is telling you the conservation of energy on the right hand side this is in newton's cradle and the idea is conservation of momentum and with all these things you will find and recall uh, using this principle it can help us to predict a lot of different scenarios and ultimately one of the main purpose of science is to predict uh, whatever things that may happen in the future and that's why we have uh, weather forecast observatory and try to hopefully see what will happen in the future and create different invention and so this is why we have learned these things because these can help us to see whether or not things are being possible or not in a reaction and so we will be checking the conservation of charge conservation of barrier number and conservation of something called lepton number later on in the next video thanks for watching i look forward to seeing you again in the next video bye